Hello, my name is Lindsay. I am a dietitian at Beth Israel. I'm one of the clinical dietitians. Um, and I am following up on part two on our little mini liver series. I know Beth just spoke with all of you about some very lovely information about nutrition and liver disease. So now we're going to delve in a bit more specifically on nutrition support and its role in liver disease. After, you know, it's deemed that a patient with cirrhosis or another form of liver disease is unable to meet their needs um, solely by mouth. Uh, we often find that tube feeds is the best first resort. Um, we Tube feeds in particular are great to help optimize patients' nutrition status if they're being worked up for transplant, um, as we are really trying to optimize um, their nutrition status prior to surgery. Most patients when they that we see at our hospital when they do get um, tube feeds, they often initially have an NG tube place, so gastric placement, which is great and fine. You know, feeding up high on the GI tract is always ideal. However, because as Beth talked about, um, feeding into the stomach or even eating into the stomach can be limited by early fullness, early satiety, nausea, because of the ascites that can put pressure on the stomach. We often find that post pyloric tubes are better tolerated by patients with cirrhosis. Um, since they're feeding past the stomach. Um, doing so can also help optimize patients' PO intake in addition to the tube feeds since there is a little bit more space um, and fullness for POs in addition to the tube feeds. Um, NG or NJ tubes are the, really the only option for enteral nutrition in patients with liver disease. Uh, surgical tubes are not indicated just because of the ascites and the abdominal distension that many liver patients often have. Um, so we often see patients that have tubes for much longer than we might normally just because of the limitations of their ascites. When it comes to formula, um, generally as with most other conditions, starting with a standard polymeric formula is ideal. Um, but there are some considerations that you know, we can think about, for instance, if a patient is very fluid overloaded and we're concerned about their fluid status, then choosing a more concentrated formula um, might be beneficial. Um, low fiber formulas can sometimes be better tolerated, especially in patients where we are feeding into the stomach, uh, since the lack of fiber will help facilitate stomach emptying uh, for patients who do get nausea or early fullness pretty quickly. Uh, in patients who have concurrent diabetes, you know, opting for a carb-controlled formula is great. Um, and patients who do have some sort of renal involvement, such as hepatorenal syndrome, as a result of their liver disease, um, those patients will benefit often from a renal formula to help control um, electrolyte management. Beth also, I know, spoke briefly about branch change amino acids. Generally, hepatic formulas or high BCAA formulas are not really generally recommended. There have been no strong evidence supporting their use over standard formulas. Um, so just starting with a standard polymeric formula is usually the best bet. When it comes to actually administering tube feeds, um, you know, I think there's a kind of cost benefit analysis between a continuous feed and cycled feeds for patients. Um, for patients who are able to still take in some POs by mouth and don't have a very, very um, limited PO and tank because of their nausea or early fullness or other complications of liver disease that we know can affect intake, um, if we're really trying to optimize the amount of food that they're able to take by mouth, a cycled regimen can often be beneficial as it allows for time off from feeds during the day to help promote PO intake at regular meal times. Um, however, in patients where PO intake is very, very minimal, um, and we really are concerned about prolonged periods of time without nutrition, continuous feeds can be a more beneficial option for this patient. Um, and just, you know, another consideration with initiating tube feeds, of course, if a patient does come in very malnourished with very poor PO intake, um, if there is concern for refeeding syndrome, then of course, following your institution's guidelines for refeeding prophylaxis. Which brings us then to the next type of nutrition support, parenteral nutrition. I would say that this is something that is generally not as heavily utilized in patients with liver disease. 
uh, is more of a last resort option for patients where enteral nutrition is contraindicated. Um, for instance, if a patient has very, very friable esophageal varices and they are unable to place a tube in, and of course we can't place a surgical tube, um, then in such an instance, perhaps TPN might be considered. However, TPN definitely has its limitations in this population. Of course, we're often worried about fluid status. Um, and so making sure that parenteral nutrition is as concentrated as possible within compounding guidelines um, to allow for minimal fluid from the parenteral nutrition. There is also risk of liver complications with TPN, uh, especially with longer term TPN um, that can exacerbate the underlying liver disease. Things like um, PN associated liver disease, we don't want to exacerbate something that's already going on. Patients with liver disease too are often have elevated levels of T bili and impaired um, biliary function. And so we do have concern for toxicity of copper and manganese. Um, so for these patients who do have elevated T bili, um, we do recommend giving trace elements just once a week to make sure that we're not causing deficiency, but also not leading to toxicity by giving these trace elements daily. The literature also shows that in some patients with liver disease, carnitine might be low, um, in which case adding carnitine can help to facilitate um, fat metabolism. Um, and so it's something to consider adding and seeing if it helps improve you know, triglyceride levels and or LFTs in these patients. Of course, knowing that these levels are abnormal um, at baseline, but if there is some sort of deficiency, adding carnitine might not hurt. If anything, it might just help. And then, of course, going back to the point of not wanting to exacerbate overall underlying liver disease, um, it's generally recommended to stick to less than one gram per kilogram of lipid um, to ensure that we're not overfeeding fat. All right, which brings us to our case study. So if you have not yet reviewed part one of this mini series, I would encourage you to do so now since we will be touching on some of those things as well, in addition to nutrition support specifically for liver disease. So I bring you our patient, a 49 year old male with past medical history of alcohol use, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who presented after having one week of worsening jaundice, lower extremity edema, and abdominal distension. On imaging in the emergency department, he was found with moderate ascites, um, and the team determined he had newly decompensated cirrhosis and was admitted for further evaluation and management. He's 71 inches tall, weighs 105 kilos, but we, through discussion with him, we learned that his usual body weight is closer to 90 to 100 kilos. With an estimated dry weight, without all the fluid on him from edema and ascites, of about 85 kilos. The team puts him on a two gram sodium diet with a one liter fluid restriction to help with his overall fluid status and volume overload. And some medications that are worth noting that he is on are a multivitamin, lactulose, rifaximin, some thiamine, folic acid, and vitamin D. When we go to see the patient, we do an NFPE and we find that he has mild fat depletions at his orbital region and triceps and moderate muscle depletions at his temples, clavicles, shoulders. However, we are unable to accurately assess his lower body stores due to the extent of his edema. So our first question that we're going to review today are, what are his calorie and protein needs? For our very tall man, um, we, and when calculating his energy and protein needs, it is important to make sure that we are using his dry weight or at least our best estimation of his dry weight um, in order to try to accurately assess his needs. So with this patient, we know that he has cirrhosis and specifically decompensated cirrhosis. So for this, we would use 35 to 40 kcals per kg to calculate his needs based off of his dry weight. So 85 kilos times 35 to 40 yields around 2,975 calories to 3,400 calories per day. He is a very large man and his energy needs are very, very elevated by his decompensated cirrhosis. So he needs a lot of calories. In terms of his protein, um, we will be using 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilo. 
So using his estimated dry weight, that gives us a range of 102 grams protein to 128 grams protein per day. After speaking with this patient, we learned that his PO intake has declined over the past month due to many of the common symptoms of cirrhosis that we see impact patients. So early satiety, low appetite, and occasional nausea with eating. This past week in particular, we learned that his usual intake has basically only included a little bit of cereal at breakfast, some black coffee, a snack of a chocolate chip granola bar, a PB&J on two slices of bread, a frozen meal such as lasagna at home. Now here in the hospital, we find that his PO intake has declined even further. He's eating this morning, he's eaten 50% of his scrambled eggs and a bite of a buttered English muffin. Yesterday for lunch, he had half of a grilled cheese. And yesterday for dinner, he had 25% of his meatloaf with 50% of mashed potatoes with no gravy because of a sodium restriction. In terms of beverages, the only thing he's had in the last 24 hours are a few sips of juice as allowed according to his fluid restriction. So the first question that we want to know is, is he meeting his nutrition needs? As I'm sure you have already guessed, no, he is absolutely not meeting his elevated needs. His early satiety, his nausea, and his overall decline in intake have really caused him to meet probably 50% at best of his estimated needs. Question number two, we're interested in what micronutrients that we might be concerned about and what we might do to address these concerns. Because of his alcohol use, we are concerned about thiamine and folate, which is why the team has already supplemented him on these micronutrients. Because of his underlying liver disease, we are worried also about zinc and vitamin D. And so we would recommend that the team continue to supplement the vit vitamin B1, thiamine, as well as folate, and check a vitamin D zinc, as well as the CRP level to help interpret the zinc level that we get back. If any of these levels are low, we would want them to supplement and replete the stores accordingly. And in the case of his vitamin D supplementation, increase it as needed. The third and final question um, that we are interested in is what nutrition interventions would we discuss with the patient? Since we know that he has early satiety, nausea, and declined PO intake, one of the most common things that we want to talk about is small frequent meals, including frequent snacks. This is to not only make sure that we are having him still get in enough nutrition throughout the day without overloading all at one meal, but also helping to decrease the time in between eating opportunities, as I like to call them with the liver patients that I see. We also want to discuss prioritizing the highest calorie and highest protein foods on our menu and house and finding ways to increase nutrition density and caloric density without increasing volume. So adding extra butters and oils to foods, choosing high fat products like dairy, low salt nut butters, avocado, ice cream, things like that, as well as encouraging intake of the highest calorie and protein nutrition supplements available on your formulary. Specifically, these high calorie and high protein nutrition supplements tend to also be more concentrated, which can help with fluid status as well. And lastly, I would make sure to encourage uh, in line with the overall theme of minimizing time between eating opportunities, making sure that the patient gets in a bedtime snack so that we are avoiding a extra prolonged um, overnight fast. So after we've spent some time talking with the patient, Two days later, we get a page from the team where they're expressing concern about the patient's ongoing poor PO intake, as well as new encephalopathy and altered mental status that's impacting his ability to take in POs. This patient is being worked up for transplant, so the team is very interested in optimizing his nutrition, specifically via tube feeds. They're asking us for recommendations. We would first want to encourage the team that before they place the tube to consider placing a post pyloric feeding tube, since we know that this patient struggles from nausea and early fullness. Going ahead and placing it early on will prevent us having to have them go back and make it go post pyloric later on, should the patient really not tolerate gastric feeds well. So my first rec would be placing a post pyloric tube. Then in terms of formula, 
I would take a, recommend taking a peek at the formulary and choosing one of the more concentrated low fiber feeds, given the patient's really high calorie needs and need for volume restriction. For this patient, um, I would also recommend starting in continuous feeds and then depending on the patient's ability to take POs, perhaps improved encephalopathy with medical management, then I might consider cycling them. But right off the bat, I would recommend continuous just because we know his PO intake has really declined and we wanna minimize time without nutrition. In terms of calculating his tube feed recs, I would likely start with a 1.5 kcal per ml formula. With say this formula has 62.7 grams protein per liter and 762 mls free water per liter. It's also a fiber free formula. If I were to use this formula, for instance, I might recommend at 90 mls an hour, which doing the lovely math brings us to 3,240 calories, 135 grams protein, and 1,646 mls of free water which if we go back to our calorie needs, fits in nicely in the higher middle high end range of needs, meets protein needs as well, slightly above the range, but a smidge more protein probably can't hurt this patient. Um, and although it does provide a little bit more free water than their overall free water restriction, um, we are making do the best we can with this 1.5 um, kcal per ml concentrated formula. All right, here are some further resources if you are interested. Um, if you guys have any questions, please drop a comment um, and like and subscribe for more.